University, I'm so excited about the next few weeks. We are entering into, or we have entered into what is considered the most holy time of the year. We have the season of Lent, which leads into Easter. And in the next 40 days, not including Sundays, as believers, we start focusing on the life and the sacrifice of Jesus. And this year for Lent, instead of telling the gospel stories, I wanted to dive deep into the theology of what Jesus did for us on the cross and in his life. Because sometimes I think we don't understand the depth of what happened in eternity and how God moved. So if you have your Bibles, I want to go to the book of Romans, book of Romans. The fifth chapter. I'm going to go do verses 12 through 19. 12 through 19. And it quite simply reads this way. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. This is my favorite line. But the free gift is not like the trespass. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespasses, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespasses, death reigned through that one man, much will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man of Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespasses led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification for all men, for all, for, for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. There's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot to unpack there. I just want to talk to you about it's not the same. It's not the same. It's not, it really isn't. It's not the same. It's not the same. Let us pray. Father God, we are ever so grateful for your presence. You've already come down and touched this place with your holy presence. You've already moved in such a profound and powerful way. As we get ready to talk about your gift to man, I ask that you move in a special way you let people know that the condemnation, the guilt, the sin, the stain is not the same as the gift that is Jesus Christ. In your holy name, amen. Reverend Cannon, the longer I live, the more I realize that people deal in polar opposites to reconcile how they deal with the world. You know, people will say big and small, cheap and expensive, dark and light. We now live in a world where it is either or. You're either good or you're bad. 
You're either saved or you're unsaved. You either have hope or you're hopelessness. You're either rich or you're poor. You're either Democrat or Republican. You're either conservative or liberal. Whatever it is, there is something that is distinctly opposite to it. But Josh, you know what the issue with that kind of thinking is? Sometimes we put too much weight on one side of the scale. Sometimes we put too much weight on things that aren't equal to the other thing. Our language and our approach to life sometimes gives weight to things that aren't as important as others just because we look at them as opposite. It's, it's a powerful manifestation. We can give things that are minor the same weight as things that are as important because of how we classify them. And I find that we have this issue in our faith. It's not our fault, it really isn't, it really isn't. It's not our fault. For years, the church says, Jesus died for our sins. So we have presented it as a replacement and an equal. As if our sins and brokenness were equal to the sacrifice of Jesus. As if they're equal. My issues, God's deliverance. My problems, God's deliverance. But it's not our fault. I mean, the reality is, is that many of us who grew up in church, how many people who grew up in church, grew up in church, went to Sunday school? The reality is, in Sunday school, we teach kids either or. They do not have the cognitive ability to understand the gradations of differences. So by the time many of us have left church in our early teenage or later teenage years and come back at a later date, we have a theology that is based on Sunday school. The church has also done a bad, a bad job with trying to make it simple enough for people to understand that we live in, 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 in an age where we have sinners and sinners and saints. As if the sinner and the saint were equal as if anybody's a saint. I ain't met none, I've never, never met a saint. Met a lot of sinners, never met a saint. I'm a sinner. Because the reality is, is we have now given equal ground to two separate concepts. And this is gonna be powerful. This is gonna set somebody free today. Because it gives your past as much weight as your future. It gives your brokenness as much weight as your freedom. It gives your hurt as much weight as your healing. And the reality is, is that your past, your brokenness, your issues, your problem has not the same weight as what Jesus is doing for you in the next season. Now, that's, that's, that's a great platitude, but I, I want to dive into the theology of it. I want to dive into the theology of it. Um, this book of Romans is a theological foundation for most of the modern Christian church. Paul, the greatest evangelist to ever live, is now writing to a church he's never met. So now he has to give his theological thesis statement of what the faith of God is. What is this Jesus thing? What is this new Christianity? How does it vary from the past? How does this thing that God is doing, this new freedom, how does it look different? How does it work different? And early on, he understood that people give as much weight to the past as they gave to Jesus' salvation. That's why he wrote the text. So what he's trying to say with these phrases, six of them in this text, I'm only going to do three, um, is that it's not the same. 
what God is doing for us, what God will do with us, how God will work with us. It's not the same as our past. It's not the same as our issues. It's not the same as our challenges. There is a different weight to it. The first thing he does, he does, he does, he does, is he talks about condemnation versus justification. If I wanted to give this a jazzy title, I'd say guilt versus freedom. If I wanted to make it plain English, past versus future. It's really simple. Let me take a step back. I need to do some, I forgot one thing. I skipped it over. I was, I was rushing because this was the good part. So in this text, Sierra, um, Paul starts off by describing Adam. Adam is the first man. Adam is the one that, that um, listened to Eve. I, all, I, just, I just read the Bible. I just read the Bible. I just read the Bible. I, I, it's, a, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. He listened to Eve, and he bit the apple. <laughs> he bit the apple. He bit the apple. He, he, he's like every husband has to listen to his wife. Uh -huh. <laughs> so he listens to Eve, listens to Eve, bites the apple. And after that, we go through what's called the fall. And we now are all born in a state of sin. No matter how perfect we try to be, we will always sin. We'll always find a way. Trust me, you, humans' ability to find a way to sin is, is miraculous. Um, how do I know? And it, 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 it's an innate in us. I once heard the example, how do you know this is a fact? All you have to do is look at a child, small child, small child. And you tell them, don't eat the cookie. A child eats the cookie. Did you eat the cookie? <laughs> the brokenness is in our nature since Adam. But Adam is a foreshadowing of Jesus. He, he's God's plan for the world. So Jesus is the answer to the issue that Adam created. So as he is, as, as, as Paul is doing the comparison, he's comparing a broken man to a divine man. He's talking about a man that with broken plans versus a Jesus that fulfills plans. And that's how we get to the text. So now we get to condemnation versus justification. And it reads quite simply like this. For the judgment following one's trespasses brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Condemnation is this very strong sense of disapproval. It's when we do wrong, we feel condemned. You notice they're not talking about the actual act. They're talking about what happens after the act. There's a sense of condemnation. There's a sense of guilt. There's a sense of issue. But then we have justification, which is which is the accounted righteousness, because when Jesus died on the cross, he justified us not just for our sins, but to live a great life. So let me break down why that's important. Condemnation is based on our mistakes. Justification is based on God's love. Condemnation leads us to shame. Justification leads us to relationship. Condemnation can be done by any man, any person, anything around you. Justification comes from God and nobody can take it from you. What I'm, I'm trying to free somebody this morning. You've heard the tape from other people condemning you for something in your life. There are situations in our life and in our world where we feel condemned. 
It's in our mind. It's in our heart. It affects our behavior. It affects our relationship. It affects how we approach everything. It could have been put in there by our family. It could have been put in there by our environment. It could have been put in there by our relationship. It could have been put in there by the news. Somebody in some experience feels guilty and condemned. But I'm here to tell you that when Jesus died on the cross, that justification, the first thing it did was wipe away all the condemnation. Your choice is, do I listen to the tape I've always listened to? Or do I step into what God has for me? The first half of your life doesn't have to look like the second half. You don't have to live in condemnation anymore. Your mistakes don't define you. You are transformed at a new creation in Christ. You are reborn and rebirthed, but now you have backup. You don't have to just do it by yourself anymore. You've got Jesus walking by your side, enabling and equipping and empowering you to live a more abundant and beautiful life. And you don't have to worry about the past. You just have to walk with Jesus a little bit while longer. And that justification will power, encourage, and lead you in a new direction. I just need you to get this because, you know, one of the things I hate, and I'm not going to say hate, is when people get stuck on their testimony. I don't have an issue with testimony. Don't, don't, don't say Pastor Smith has an issue with testimony. I don't have an issue with testimony because I believe it is what God did in somebody's life, and that's so important. But if 15 years later, all you have is the same testimony and you have a living God, you got stuck in a place that God had so much more for you. Tell me the testimony, but then start telling me how when I started walking with Jesus and I started talking with Jesus, how he not only healed me from drugs, not only healed me from issues, not only moved me, but then he moved me forward in my career. And then he moved me forward in my family. Then he gave me opportunities to live in my community. Then he allowed me to give back to others. Then he allowed me to go to church and wake up this morning. Then he gave me good health. Then he gave me kids. And then he gave me grandkids. And then he allowed me. That's what the testimony is all the way back here. And he has so much more for you. That's why. I got to encourage somebody, don't get stuck on your testimony. The next thing, next thing is death versus abundance. You know, you don't got to die to be dead. You don't have to die to be dead. It was, a, it was a movie back in the days that a young little girl in the movie said, I see dead people walking. <laughs> I'm not going to say it in here. <laughs> but I go to the mall, I see dead people walking. Go to corporate headquarters and school campuses, I see dead people walking. It's right simple. Because the scripture reads, for if because of one man's trespasses, death reigned through that one man, much more with those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of reign life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Um, Josh, we live in a world that specializes in the negative. I've got factual information on that. I just turn on my news. There are millions of great things happening in the world, but the number one news story every day is the negative. The more negative it can be, the more it'll make the headline. 
But the news is only reflection of the culture, and culture is only reflection of the people that live in the culture. How many of us have people in our lives that don't look straight, don't look at the person beside you? That every time you talk to them, they start off with a negative. They start off with the brokenness. They start off with the issues. They start off with the critique or the criticism. They start off with why it's dead. Your soul dies every time you, every time you live in the negative. God is a God of creation. God is a God of hope. God is a God of life. Not saying he's an unrealistic God that you're not dealing with negative situations in your life. But if you steep yourself like a bag of tea in negative situations in your life and always lift them up, how do you move forward? The reality is, is more of us spend time on the death side as believers than we do on the abundant side. The scripture talks about grace and righteousness. The first thing is what God gives us. The second thing is how it plays out. God gives us grace to live our life. Because he definitely understands. Many of us, um, I I was saved when I was 11. Um, I walked down the aisle. I accepted Jesus Christ, got baptized at 11. Let me tell you what I have not been since I've been 11. Perfect. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'll probably walk out the door today and do something wrong. Can't define it, don't know what it is, but it's just human nature. But the great thing is, is I'm covered by grace. And the longer I walk with Jesus, the longer I talk with Jesus, I might not be perfect, but he starts building righteousness in my life. He starts according righteousness to me because I choose to follow him because he has given me grace. Many people say, um, after I'm saved, why do I follow Jesus? It's not because the old ladies at church are going to tell you to go to hell. I don't know, not this church, but the church I grew up in. <laughs> hell, me going to hell was a significant part of, of, of the theological structure. Is the best part of God not going to hell? Is the best part of God not going to hell? Is the best part of the creator of the universe not going to hell? Is the best part of the one that died on the cross for me and me not going to hell? You see how we gave too much weight to something that's not equal. Is grace so I can live a life in the presence of the creator of the universe? The one that created every star and every moon. The one that figured out the water content in the sky so it's blue. The one that figured out how much chlorophyll needed to be grass, that it's green. The one that figured out how to make my heart pump every morning without me thinking about it. The one that leads me to amazing relationships with my friends and family. The one that blesses me even when I don't deserve to be blessed. The one that guards me from the attack of the devil. The God that blesses me with eternal life at the end of this journey even though I am not perfect. The one that will take care of the generation generations before and the generations after me. The God that will bless me in all I am doing. The God that has kept me safe for all of my 43 years. I don't know about you, but if hell is all you're holding out for, you are selling yourself short because grace leads to righteousness, which leads to deliverance. And all I need to say to you is you need to celebrate God right now because it's not about hell. It's about heaven. It's about what he can do and how he can bless you. It is about the abundant life that and he's promised his belief. Death versus abundance. 
And the last one, last point, is switch. Law versus grace. Now the law came in to increase the trespasses. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The days of us presenting Christianity as a legalist are over. Um, you know, somebody said, said to me, what's the dress code for university? And we'll break down why there's issues with dress code. That automatically means you have to wear something and look a specific way, a legal binding thing to actually be in the house of God. Somebody says, where is the officer's section in the church? So there are specific seats for positions. That means there's a legalistic boundary. Who can come to this church? Or there's African and anybody that wants to. There isn't a legal boundary. Somebody said to me, you know, you're not really Amy Zion. I was like, oh, probably not. We're going to take that down right after, right after, right? Because they say, you know, you, 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 know you, you, don't do the, you don't do the processional. And you don't do the glory of Patry. And we don't sit and stand 17 times. That's legal. But you know what the sad part about legalistic stuff is? The majority of legalistic stuff, particularly in the church and faith, is preference, not Bible. Somebody told the Presbyterians to do it a certain way, the Methodists to do it a certain way, um, whoever else to do it a certain way. And they did it a certain way. And now it's become their culture. It's become ingrained. That's what we got to do. You know, the best is when, when you talk to people that are in non-denominational churches. They're like, we don't follow any of the rules. But every non-denominational church I go to, you know, they sing for 40 minutes, do a sermon, sit down. That's their legalism. I'm, I'm, I'm here because this is the reality. What God did was he freed us from the law of men. And great was grace to live in the law, grace to live in the, in the light of God. And now, because I live in the light of God and his grace and his mercy, I do better because of his love for me. You know, the days of telling women they need to wear a skirt down to their ankle and they need to have their head covered, or the days of telling men you need to have a suit and a tie so you can come into the church, those are over because that's not in my Bible. The days of defining how we should worship. You know, one of the interesting things, we have a call every Monday night, and, and we change a service almost every three weeks or four weeks, do different things, try different things. And it's not, and we say, my job on the call is to make sure the theology is right, but we don't, we are looking for the best way to worship in this context, in this time, for the people God sends us. What I grew up, how I grew up in church won't work for today, won't work for Silicon Valley, won't work for this place, won't work for this time. We've got to find ways that break legalistic preferences and start living in the grace of God. Now, let me explain what this does for your personal life. I picked on church long enough. Many of us have legalistic structures from family, from culture, and from church that define our lives. They were somebody else's preference, and it has hobbled and handicapped us.
And the question is, you can only answer for yourself, what legalistic issues am I dealing with from my past and not living in the grace that God has given me? How have I let somebody's preference from 18 something, something, another define how I see God in 2020? We don't really have to take this down. I was, I was sitting in a service the other day, um, and, and, and I said to somebody, cultures clash in the service because the, the group was singing like this old, like, anthem and I'm looking at them I'm like there's a bunch of young people and it just didn't make sense it was culture clashing was living in grace here goes my question for you university are you giving the legalistic things in your life too much weight and the grace in your life too little consideration Jesus didn't come to even the score. See, that's a mistake. We're looking at Jesus coming to even the score. Get us back to board. That's not what Jesus came for. He came so we would have life more abundantly, that we would be transformed creations, that we would be his best image. And we're living below our potential by thinking it's the same. It's not the same. May we please stand.